The following is a conversation with Dmitry Korkin, his second time on the podcast. He's a professor of bioinformatics and computational biology at WPI, where he specializes in bioinformatics of complex disease, computational genomics, systems biology, and biomedical data analytics. He loves biology, he loves computing, plus he is Russian and recites a poem in Russian at the end of the podcast. What else could you possibly ask for in this world? Quick mention of our sponsors, Brave Browser, NetSuite Business Management Software, Magic Spoon Low Carb Cereal, and 8Sleep Self-Cooling Mattress. So the choice is browsing privacy, business success, healthy diet, or comfortable sleep. Choose wisely, my friends. And if you wish, click the sponsor links below to get a discount and to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that to me, the scientists that did the best, apolitical, impactful, brilliant work of 2020 are the biologists who study viruses without an agenda, without much sleep, to be honest, just a pure passion for scientific discovery and exploration of the mysteries within viruses. Viruses are both terrifying and beautiful. Terrifying because they can threaten the fabric of human civilization, both biological and psychological. Beautiful because they give us insights into the nature of life on Earth and perhaps even extraterrestrial life of the not so intelligent variety that might meet us one day as we explore the habitable planets and moons in our universe. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, here's my conversation with Dmitry Korkin. It's often said that proteins and uh, the amino acid residues that make them up are the building blocks of life. Do you think of proteins in this way as the uh, basic building blocks of life? Yes and no. So the proteins indeed is the, the basic unit, biological unit that carries out uh, important function of the cell. However, through studying the proteins and comparing the proteins across different species, across dis- different kingdoms, you realize that uh, proteins are actually a more, a much more complicated. Uh, so they have um, so-called modular complexity. And so uh, what I mean by that is uh, an average protein consists of um, of several structural units. So we call them uh, protein domains. And so you can imagine a protein as a string of beads where each bead is a protein domain. And, uh, you know, in the past 20 years, scientists have been studying uh, the nature of the protein domains because uh, we realized that it's 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 the unit because if you look at the functions right so so uh, many proteins have more than one function and those uh, protein functions uh, are often carried out by those protein domains so uh, we also see that uh, in the evolution those proteins domains get shuffled so so they act actually as as a unit also from the structural perspective, right? So, you know, you, uh, some people think of uh, a protein as a sort of a globular uh, molecule, but as a matter of fact, is is uh, the globular part of this protein is a protein domain. So we, we often have this, uh, you know, again, the, the, the uh, collection of this protein domains uh, align uh, on a string as beads. And the, uh, the protein domains are made up of amino acid residues. Yes. So we're talking, so, it's, it's, it's so this still... is the basic, bu- so you're saying the protein domain is the basic building block of the function that we think about proteins doing. So of course you can always talk about different building blocks, it's turtles all the way down, but it's there's a point where there is, uh, at the point of the hierarchy where it's the most, the cleanest element block based on which you can put them together in different kinds of ways to form complex function. And you're saying protein domains. Why is that not talked about as often in in popular culture? Well, you know, there are several perspectives on this. Um, 
and uh, one of course is the historical perspective, right? So uh, historically, uh, scientists have been able to structurally resolve to obtain the three D coordinates of uh, a protein for uh, you know for smaller proteins, and smaller proteins tend to be a single domain protein. So we have a Got protein it. equal to a protein domain. And so, so because of that, the initial suspicion was that uh, the, the the proteins are they have globular shapes, and the more uh, of smaller proteins y you obtain structurally, the more you were you became convinced that that's that's the the case. And only later, when uh, we had we started having, um, you know, uh, alternative approaches, so you know. The, the the traditional uh, the traditional ones are X-ray crystallography and NMR spectroscopy. So these are sort of the 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 two main techniques uh, that uh, give us the three D coordinates. But nowadays uh, there is huge breakthrough in uh, cryo-electron microscopy. So the the more advanced methods that allow us to uh, you know to get into the uh, you know, 3D uh, shapes of much larger molecules, molecular complexes. Just to give you uh, one of the common examples uh, for this year, right? So, so the the first experimental structure of a SARS-CoV-2 protein was the cryo-EM structure of the S protein, so the spike protein, and so uh, it was solved very quickly and the reason for that is the advancement of the uh, of this technology is is pretty spectacular how many domains does the uh is it more than one domain oh yes spike, oh yes so, i mean so, so so it's it's a very complex structure and and it's complex. Uh, we you know on top of the complexity of a single protein right so this this structure is actually is a complex is a trimer so it needs to form a trimer in order to function properly. What's a complex? So a complex is agglomeration of uh, multiple proteins. Okay. And so uh, we can have the same protein copied in multiple, uh, you know, uh, made up in multiple copies and forming something that we call uh, a homo oligomer. Homo means the same, right? So, so in this case, so uh, uh, sp the spike protein is the is an example of a ho homo tetram, uh, homo trimer. Sorry, so, so it means th three copies of a three so copies in order exactly. to <laughs> exactly. We have the these three chains, the the three molecular chains uh, coupled uh, together and performing the the function. That's what when when you look at this protein from from the top, you see a perfect triangle. Yeah. So, uh, but other, uh, you know, so other complexes are made up of, um, you know, different proteins. Uh, some of them are completely different. Some of them are similar, the, the hemoglobin molecule, right? So it's actually, it's a protein complex. It's made of four basic subunits. Two of them uh, are identical to each other and two other are identical to each other, but they are also similar to each other, which, sort of uh, gives us uh, some ideas about the evolution of this, uh, you know, uh, of this uh, molecule. And uh, perhaps so one of the hypotheses is that, you know, uh, in the past, it was just a homo tetramer, right? So four identical comp uh, mm -hmm. copies, and then it became, you know, uh, sort of uh, modified, it, it became mutated uh, over the time and, and became more specialized. Can we uh, linger on the spike protein for a little bit? Uh, is is there something interesting or like beautiful you find about it? I mean, first of all, it's an incredibly challenging protein. And so we, as a part of uh, our sort of uh, research to understand the structural basis of this virus, to sort of decode, structure decode every single protein uh, in its proteome, um, we tr you know we've been working on the spike uh, protein, and uh, one of the main challenges was that uh, the uh, cryo EM uh, data allows us to uh, reconstruct or to obtain the three D coordinates of roughly two thirds of the protein. The rest of the one third uh, of this protein, it's a part that. Uh, is buried into the into the membrane yeah. of the virus, 
and uh, of the of, of the viral envelope, and uh, it also has a lot of unstable structures around it. So it's chemically interacting somehow with whatever the heck it's, it's connecting. Yeah. To. So so it people are still trying to understand. So so the the nature of and the the role of this uh, you know uh, of this uh, one third because the the top part uh, you know the the primary function is to get attached to the you know uh, ACE2 receptor human receptor there is also beautiful you know mo uh, mechanics of how this thing happens right so because there are three different uh, copies of this uh, chains uh, you know there are three different domains right so we're talking about domains so so this is the receptor binding domains rbds that gets untangled and get ready to 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 get attached to to the receptor and now they are not necessarily going in a sync mode as a matter of fact say synchronous so yes so and this is this is where you know yeah. the another level of complexity comes into play because you know right now what we see is we typically see just one of the arms going out yeah. And getting ready to 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 be attached to the uh, uh, to the ACE2 receptors. However, there was a recent mutation that uh, uh, people studied in that uh, spike protein, and uh, a uh, very recently a group from uh, UMass Medical School. Uh, we happened to collaborate with groups. So this is a group of uh, Jeremy Luban and uh, a number of uh, other faculty. Uh, they uh, actually uh, solve the uh, the mutated structure of the spike, and they showed that actually, because of these mutations, you have more than one arms opening up, <laughs> and so now, so you, so the frequency of two arms going up incre increase quite you know drastically. Oh, interesting. Does that does that change the dynamics somehow? It how it's it, it potentially can change the dynamics of because now you have two possible opportunities to get attached to the ACE2 receptor. It's a very complex molecular process, mechanistic process. But the first step of this process is the attachment of this spike protein of the spike trimer to the human ACE2 receptor. So this is a molecule that sits on the surface of the human cell. Yes. And that's so, essentially what initiates, the what triggers the, the whole the, process of in, you know encapsulation. Of, uh, uh, if this was dating, this would be the first date. So this is the... Uh, <laughs> in a way, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so is it is it possible to have the spike protein just like floating about on its own? Or does it need that interactability with, uh, uh, with the membrane? Yeah, so it needs to be attached at least as far as I know, but uh, you know, when you get this thing attached on the surface, right? There is also a lot of dynamics on where, it, how it sits on the surface, right? Yeah. So, for example, uh, there was a recent uh, work in uh, again uh, where people use the cryo-electron microscopy to get the first glimpse of the overall structure. It's a very low res, but you still get some interesting details about the surface, about what is happening inside, because we have literally no clue until recent work about how the, the capsid is organized. What's how, the capsid? So capsid is essentially, it's the inner core of the viral particle where the uh, there is a, the RNA of the virus and it's pr protected by another protein, N protein, uh, uh, that essentially acts as a shield but you know uh, now we are learning more and more so it's actually it's not just this shield it's you is potentially is used for the stability of the outer shell of the uh, of the virus so it's it's pretty complicated and uh so, i mean understanding all of this is really useful for trying to figure out like developing a vaccine or some kind of drug to attack any aspects of this right so i mean there are many different implications to that I mean, first of all you know it's it's important to understand the virus itself right so you know in order to uh to understand how it acts what 
is the overall mechani mechanistic process of this virus, replication of this virus, proliferation to the cell, right? So, so that's one uh, aspect. The, the other aspect is, you know, designing new treatments, right? So one of the uh, possible treatments is, uh, you know, designing nanoparticles. And so some nanoparticles that will resemble the viral shape that would have the spike integrated and essentially would act uh, as a competitor to the real virus by blocking the ACE2 receptors and thus preventing the real virus entering the cell. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there are also, uh, you know, there is a very interesting uh, direction in uh, looking at the, at the membrane, at the envelope portion of the protein and attacking its uh, M protein. So, so there are, uh, you know, to give you a, you know, sort of a brief overview, there are four structural proteins. That these are the proteins that made up a structure of the virus. So, spike as protein that acts as a trimer so it needs three copies e envelope protein that acts as a pentamer so it needs five copies mm -hmm. to act properly m uh, is a uh, is a membrane protein and it, it forms dimers and actually it forms beautiful lattice and this is something that we've been studying and we are seeing it in simulations it it actually forms a very nice grid or you know, uh, you know threads uh, you know uh, of of different dimers attached next to each so other it's a bunch a of copies path. of each other and they naturally when you have a bunch of copies of each other they form an interesting lattice exactly and okay. and you know you, if you think about it right so 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 the this complex you know, the, the, vi the viral shape needs to be organized somehow, self-organized somehow, right? So it, it, you know, if it was a completely random process, you know, you probably wouldn't have the, the, the envelope shell of the ellipsoid shape. You know, you would have something, you know, uh, pre-random, right, uh, shape. So there is some, you know, regularity in how this, uh, you know, uh, how these uh, M dimers get to attach to each other in a very specific directed way. Is that understood at all? Uh, it's not understood. We are now, uh, we, we've been working in the past six months since you know we, we <laughs> met, actually this is where, where we started working on, on trying to understand the overall uh, structure of the envelope and the, the key components that made up this, uh, you know, uh, structure. Wait, does the envelope also have the lattice structure or no? So, so the envelope is essentially is the outer shell okay. of the viral particle. The N, the nucleocapsid protein, is something that is inside. Got it. But get that, the N is likely to interact with M. Does it go M and E? Like, where's the E and the so M? so E? Those different proteins they occur in different copies on the viral particle. So, so E, this pentamer complex, we only have two or three maybe per each particle, mm -hmm. okay? We have thousand or so of M dimers that essentially made up, uh, that makes up uh, the entire, you know, outer shell. Outer shell. So most of the outer shell is the M. M dimer. It's and the M protein. When you say particle, that's the viron, the virus, the individual it's a virus. Single, yes. Single, single element of the virus. Exactly. Single virus. Single virus. Yeah. Right. And we have about, you know, roughly 50 to 90 spike trimers. Right. So, so, so when you, you know, when you show a per, per virus particle. Per virus particle. F right. Sorry. What did you say? 50 to 90? 50 to 90, right? Cool. So, so this is how this thing is organized. And so now typically, right? So you see these, uh, uh, the, uh, the antibodies that target, you know, spike protein, certain parts of the spike protein, but there could be some, uh, also some treatments, right? So, so these are, you know, these are small molecules that bind strategic parts of these proteins disrupting its functioning. So one of the promising directions, uh, it's one of the newest directions, is actually targeting the M dimer of the protein, targeting the proteins that make up this outer shell. Because if you're able to destroy the outer shell, you're essentially destroying the, the, the viral particle itself. 
So preventing it from from you know functioning at all. So that's you think is uh, from a sort of cybersecurity perspective, virus security perspective, that's the best attack vector. Is, uh, or like this, uh, that's a promising attack vector. I, I would say yes. So I mean, it's, it's, it's still tons of research needs to be, you know, to be done. But uh, yes, I think you know. So there's more attack surface, I guess. <laughs> more attack surface, but you know, from from our analysis, from other evolutionary analysis, this protein is evolutionarily more stable compared to the say to the spike protein. Oh, and stable means a, a more uh, static target <laughs> well yeah so so it, it 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 doesn't change it doesn't evolve from the evolutionary perspective so drastically as for example the spike protein there's a bunch of stuff in the news about mutations of the virus in the united kingdom yeah. i also saw in south africa something maybe that was yesterday uh you just kind of mentioned about stability and so on which aspects of this are mutatable and which aspects, if mutated, become more dangerous? And maybe even zooming out, what are your thoughts and knowledge and ideas about the way it's mutated, all the news that we've been hearing? Are you worried about it from a biological perspective? Are you worried about it from a human perspective? So, I mean, you know, mutations are sort of a general way for these viruses to evolve. Right, so so it's you know it's uh, essentially this is the way they evolved. This is the way they were able to jump from you know one species to another. We also see uh, you know some recent jumps. There were some incidents uh, of this virus jumping from human to dogs. So you know there is, there is some danger in 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 those jumps because you know every time it jumps it. Also mutates, right? So, so it when it jumps to to the uh, to the species and jumps back, yeah. right? So it acquires some mutations that are sort of uh, driven by the environment of a new host, yeah. right? And it's different uh, from the human environment, and so we don't know whether the mutations that are acquired uh, in the new species are neutral with respect to the human host or maybe, you know, maybe um, damaging. Yeah, change is always scary. But yeah. so are you worried about, I mean, it seems like because the spread is during winter now is, seems to be exceptionally high. Uh, and uh, especially with a vaccine just around the corner already being actually deployed, is there some worry that the, there's this puts evolutionary pressure, selective pressure on the virus? afford to uh to mute for you to mutate is that a yes. source of worry well i mean there is always this thought uh, you know in 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 the scientist my mi mind uh, you know what happen what will happen right so uh i know there have been uh there have been discussions about sort of the arms race between the you know the ability of of the uh of the you know humanity to uh you know to get vaccinated faster than the virus you know uh <laughs> essentially you know becomes uh you know resistant to to the vaccine um i i mean i don't worry that much uh simply because uh, you know there is not that much evidence to that to aggressive mutation around the vaccine Exactly. You know, obviously there are mutations around the vaccine. You know, uh, there are vaccines. So the reason we get vaccinated every year against the it's season of flu, mutations, right? Um, but uh, you know, I think it's important to study it. No doubts, right? So, so I think one of the you know, to me, and uh, again, I might be biased uh, because you know we, we we've been uh, trying to to do that as well. Uh, so, but one of the critical directions in understanding the virus is to un uh, to understand its evolution, in order to uh, sort of understand the mechanisms, the key mechanisms that lead the virus to jump. You know, the Nordic viruses to jump from species from species to another. That uh, the mechanisms that lead the virus to become resistant uh, to vaccines, also to treatments, right? 
and hopefully that knowledge was uh, will enable us to sort of forecast the evolutionary uh, traces, the future evolutionary traces of this virus. I mean, what, uh, from a biological perspective, this might be a dumb question, but is there parts of the virus that if uh, souped up, like through mutation, could make it more effective at doing its job? We're talking about the specific coronavirus, like, because yeah. we were talking about the different, like the membrane, the M protein, the E protein, the N, and the uh, S, the spike, is there some? Uh, and there part... are 20 or so more <laughs> in addition to that. <laughs> but is that is that a dumb way to look at it? Like uh, which of these, if mutated, could have the greatest impact, potentially damaging impact on the effectiveness of the virus? So it's actually, it's it's a very good question uh, because, and, and the short answer is we don't know yet, but, uh, of course, there is capacity of this virus to to become more efficient. The reason for that is, um, you know, so if you look at the virus, I mean, it's it's a machine, right? So it's a machine that does a lot of different functions, and many of these functions are sort of nearly perfect, but they are not perfect. And uh, those mutations can make those functions more perfect. For example, the attachment to ACE2 receptor, right, of the spike, right? So uh, you know, is it, has this virus reached the efficiency in which the attachment is carried out? Or there are some mutations that uh, that still to be discovered, right, that will uh, make this attachment uh, sort of uh, stronger or, you know, something uh, more, in a way, more efficient from the point of view of this virus functioning. That's that's sort of uh, the obvious example, but if you look at each of these proteins, I mean, it's there for a reason, it performs certain function. And uh, it could be that certain mutations will you know, enhance this function. It could be that some mutations will make this function much less efficient, right? right? So that's that's also the case. Let's, uh, s since we're talking about the evolutionary history of a virus, uh, let's s zoom back out and uh, look at the evolution of proteins. I, I glanced at this uh, 2010 Nature paper on the, quote, ongoing expansion of the protein universe. Yeah. And then, you know, it kind of implies and uh, talks about that uh, proteins started with a common ancestor, which is, you know, kind of interesting. It's interesting to think about like, even just like the first organic thing that started life on earth. And from that, there's now, uh, you know, what is it? 3.5 billion years later, there's now millions of proteins and they're still evolving. And that's, you know, in part, one of the things that you're researching. Is there something interesting to you about the evolution of proteins from this initial ancestor uh, to today? Is there something beautiful, insightful about this long story? So I think, you know, uh, if if I were to pick a single keyword about uh, protein evolution, I would pick uh, modularity, something that we talked about uh, in, the, in the beginning, and that's the fact that the proteins are no longer considered as, you know, as a sequence of letters. There are hierarchical, uh, complexities in the way these proteins are organized. And uh, these complexities are go actually going beyond the protein sequence. It's actually going all the way back to the, uh, to the gene, to the nucleotide sequence. And so, you know, again, these protein domains they are not only functional building blocks, they are also evolutionary building blocks. And so what we see in the sort of in the later stages of evolution, I mean, once this stable st structurally and functionally building blocks were discovered, they essentially, they s stay, those domains stay as such. So that's why if you start comparing uh, different proteins, you will see that uh, many of them will have similar fragments. And those fragments will correspond to something that we call protein domain families. Uh, 
And so, so they are still different because you you still have mutations and 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 the, you know uh, the uh, you know different mutations are attributed to to you know diversification of the function of this uh, you know uh, protein domains. However, you don't you very rarely see um, you know the the evolutionary events that would split this domain into fragments because and it's you know. Uh, once you have the 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 the, uh, pr the domain split, you actually you uh, you know you can completely cancel out its function, or at the very least you can reduce it, and that's not you know efficient from the point of view of the you know of the cell functioning. So so the 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 protein domain level is a very important one. Now, on top of that. Right, so if you look at the proteins, right, so you have these structural units, and they carry out the function. But then, uh, much less is known about things that connect these protein domains. Mm -hmm. Something that we call linkers, and those linkers are completely flexible, you know, parts of the protein that nevertheless carry out a lot of function. It's like little tails, little heads. So, so, protein. so we we do have tails. So they call termini, C and N termini. So these are things right on the on on uh, on uh, one and another ends of the protein sequence. So they are also very important. So they they attributed to to very specific uh, interactions between the proteins. So, but you're referring to the links between the, domains that connect the domains, and you know, apart from the just the the uh, simple perspective if you have you know a very short domain you have uh, sorry a very short linker you have two domains next to each other they are forced to be next to each other if you have a very long one you have the domains that are extremely flexible and they carry out a lot of sort of spatial reorganization right That's so, so awesome. <laughs> but on top of that right just this linker itself because it's so flexible it actually can adapt to a lot of different shapes, and therefore it's a it's a very good interactor when it comes to interaction between this protein and other protein, right? So these things also evolve, you know, uh, and they in a way have different law, uh, sort of uh, uh, laws of uh, uh, or the driving laws that uh, underlie the the evolution because they no longer need to uh, to uh, preserve certain structure right uh, unlike protein domains and so on top of that you have uh, something that is even less studied and this is something that uh, 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 attributed to to the concept of alternative splicing mm. so alternative splicing so it's a, it's a very cool uh, concept it's something that uh, uh, we've been fascinated about for you know over a decade uh, in my lab and trying to do research with that but so you know so so typically you know a, a, a simplistic sp perspective is that one gene is equal one protein product right so you have a gene it, you know you transcribe it and, and and translate it and you it becomes a protein in reality when we talk about uh, eukaryotes especially sort of uh, more recent eukaryotes that are very complex the gene is no is no longer equal to one protein it actually can uh produce multiple functionally uh you know active protein products and each of them is uh you know is uh, uh called an alternatively spliced product the reason it happens is that if you look at the gene it actually has it has also blocks and the blocks some of which, and it, it essentially it goes like this. So we have a, a block that will later be translated. We call it exon. Then we'll have a block that is not translated, cut out. Mm -hmm. We call it intron. So we have exon, intron, exon, intron, etc., etc., etc. Right. So and some, sometimes you can have, uh, you know, dozens of these exons and introns. Mm -hmm. So what happens is during the the process when the gene is converted to RNA. We have things that are cut out, 
the introns that uh, cut out and exons that now get assembled together. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we will throw out some of the exons and the remaining protein product will become- It'll still be the same. Differ different. Oh, different. Right? So, so now you have uh, fragments of the protein that no longer there. They were cut out with the introns. Okay. Sometimes you will you know, essentially take one exon and replace it with another one. Right. So there's some flexibility in the, in, in this process. So so that creates a whole new level of complexity. Because now is this random though. Is it, it random? Uh, it's it's not random. We and and this is where I think uh, now the the appearance of this modern uh, single cell uh, and and the, uh, before that tissue level sequencing, next generation sequencing techniques such as RNA seq allows us to see that these these are the events that often happen in response in it's a, it's a dynamic event that happens in response to to disease or in response to certain developmental stage of a cell and and this is an incredibly complex layer that also undergoes i mean because it's a, at the gene level right so it undergoes certain evolution right and uh now we have this interplay between what happening, what is happening in the in the protein world, and what is happening in the in the gene and you know RNA world. And for example, you know it's it's often that we see that the boundaries of these exons coincide with the boundaries of the protein domains. Right, so mm -hmm. so the, there is there is uh, you know uh, close interplay to that. Uh, it's not always. I mean, you know, uh, otherwise it would be too simple, right? But we do see the connection between those sort of machineries, and obviously the evolution will pick up this complexity, and uh, you know, select for whatever is successful. We, whatever yeah, is we, we, we we see that complexity in play, and and makes this question. You know, more complex, but more exciting. As a small detour, I don't know if you think about this in, into the world of computer science. There's uh, uh, Douglas Hostetter, I think, came up with a, a, a name of Quine, which are, I don't know if you're familiar with these things, but it's computer programs that have, uh, I guess, exon and intron, and they copy, the whole purpose of the program is to copy itself. So mm -hmm. it prints copies of itself, but can also carry information inside of it. So it's a very kind of crude, fun exercise oh, yeah. of um, can we sort of replicate these ideas from cells? Of can we have a computer program that when you run it, it just prints itself, yes. the, whole, the entirety yes. of itself, and does it in different programming languages and so on. And I've been playing around and writing them. It's a kind of fun little exercise. You know, when I was a kid, so so you know, it it was essentially one of the of the sort of main stages in in uh, informatics Olympiads mm -hmm. that you have to reach <laughs> in order to be any so good. Yeah. Is you should be able to write a program that replicates itself. And so the tax then becomes even you know sort of more complicated. So what is the shortest? What is the shortest program? Yeah. And of course it's it's you know it's a function of a programming language. But yeah, I, I remember you know long 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 time ago when we tried to you know to to make it shorter and shorter and find the the the, the shortcuts. There's actually on uh, Stack Exchange. There's a, a entire site called Code Golf. I think where the entirety is just a competition. People just come up with whatever task. I don't know, like uh, write code that reports the weather today. And the competition is about the in shortest. whatever programming language, what is the shortest program? And it makes you actually, people should check it out because it makes you realize there's some some weird programming languages out there. Um, but you know, just to dig on that a little uh, deeper, uh, do you think, you know, in computer science, we don't often think about programs. There's like the machine learning world now uh, that's still kind of basic programs. And then there's humans that replicate themselves, right? And there's these mutations and so on. Do you think we'll ever have a world where there's programs that kind of have an evolutionary process? 
So I'm not talking about evolutionary algorithms, but I'm talking about programs that kind of mate with each other and evolve and like on their own replicate themselves. So this is kind of uh, the idea here is, you know, that's how you can have a runaway thing. So we think about machine learning as a system that gets smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. At least the machine learning systems of today ha are like, it's, it's a program that you can like turn off as opposed to throwing a bunch of little programs out there and letting them like multiply and mate and evolve and replicate. Do you ever think about that kind of world? You know, when we jump from the biological systems that uh, you're looking at to, to artificial ones? I mean, it's almost like you, you take the, the sort of the area of intelligent agents, right? Yes. Which are essentially the, the independent sort of uh, codes that run and interact and exchange yep. the information, right? So I, I don't see why not. I mean, I, I, you know, it could be sort of a, a natural evolution in, 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 in this you know, uh, area of computer science. I think it's kind of interesting possibility. It's terrifying too, but I think it's a really powerful tool. Like to have like agents that inter, you know, we have social networks with millions of people and they interact. I think it's interesting to inject into that. There's already injected into that bots, right? But those bots are pretty dumb. Uh, uh, you know, they're they're probably pretty dumb algorithms. Uh, you know, it's interesting to think that there might be bots that evolve together with humans. And there's the sea of humans and robots that are operating first in the digital space. And then you can also think, I, I love the idea, some people worked, I think uh, at Harvard, at Penn, there's uh, robotics labs that, you know, build, take as a fundamental task to build a robot that given extra resources can build another copy of itself, mm -hmm. like in the physical space, yeah. which is uh, super difficult to do, but super interesting. Yes. I, I remember there's like research on robots that can build a bridge. So they make a copy of themselves and mm -hmm. they connect themselves. And yeah. so it's like self-building bridge based on building blocks. You can imagine like a building that self-assembles. Yes. So it's basically self-assembling structures from uh, from uh, robotic parts. But it's interesting to, within that robot, add the ability to mutate and, uh, and and do all the interesting like little things that you're referring to in evolution to go from a single origin protein building block to like this well, weird complexity. And, and if you think about this, I mean, you know, the bits and pieces are there, you know, so so you mentioned yeah, right. the evolutionary <laughs> algorithm, right? You know, so this is sort of, you know, and uh, the, the, maybe it's sort of the, the, the goal is in a way different right so the goal is to you know to essentially uh, to to optimize your search right, right? so uh, but uh, sort of the the ideas are there so so you, people recognize that you know that uh, the you know recombination events lead to global changes in the in in, in the search trajectories the mutations event is a more refined uh, you know uh, step in the search then you have you know uh, other sort of uh, nature inspired algorithm right so so one of the reasons that uh, that I, you know i think it's it's one of the funnest one is the slime uh, based algorithm right so that, that <laughs> it's uh, i think the first was introduced by the japanese uh, group but where it was able to to solve uh, some some pre you know complex problems uh, so so that's the, you know, and and then i think uh there are still a lot of things we've yet to, to you know, borrow from the nature, right? So there are a lot of sort of ideas that nature, uh, you know, gets to offer us that, mm -hmm. you know, it's up to us to grab it and to, 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 you know, get the best use of it. Including neural networks, you know, that we have a very crude insp inspiration from nature on neural networks, maybe there's, other inspirations to be discovered in the brain or other aspects of uh, the various systems, even like the immune system, the way it, it uh, interplays. I recently un started to understand that the, like, the immune system has something to do with the way the brain operates. Like there's multiple things going on in there, which uh, all of which are not modeled in artificial neural networks. And maybe if you throw a little bit of that biological spice in there, you'll come up with something uh, something cool. I, mean, I 
I, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Drake equation that uh, estimate, I just did a video on it yesterday because I wanted to give my own estimate of it. It's, uh, it's an equation that combines a bunch of factors to estimate how many alien civilizations are oh, yeah. in the I've, galaxy. I've, I've heard about this, yes. <laughs> so yes. One, one of the interesting parameters, you know, it's like uh, how many uh, stars are born every year, how many planets are on average per star, uh, for this, how many habitable planets are there. Mm -hmm. And then the, the one that starts being really interesting is uh, the probability that life emerges on a habitable planet. So like, I don't know if you think about, you certainly think a lot about evolution, but do you think about the thing which evolution doesn't describe, which is like the beginning of evolution, <laughs> the origin of life. I think I put the probability of life developing in a habitable planet at 1%. This is very scientifically uh, rigorous. Okay, uh, well, first at a high level for the Drake equation, what would you put that percent at on earth? And in general, do you have something, do you have thoughts about how life might've started? You know, like the proteins being the first kind of, one of the early jumping points? Yeah, so, so, um... I think back in 2018, there was a very exciting paper published in Nature where they um, found uh, one of the simplest amino acids, glycine, in a, in a comet dust. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, uh, and I, I apologize if I uh, don't pronounce, it's a, Russian named comets is I think Chugrimov Gerasimenko. Mm -hmm. This is the comet where, and there was this uh, um, mission to to get and uh, get close to this comet and get the the uh, stardust from from its tail. And uh, when scientists analyzed it, they actually found traces of uh, you know uh, of glycine. Which you know makes up you know the it's one of the basic uh, one of the twenty basic uh, amino acids that makes up proteins, right? So, uh, so that was kind That's of exciting. very exciting, That's, right? <laughs> but you know, it's it, the question is very interesting, right? So, what uh, you know, what if there is some alien life? Is it going to be made of? proteins, yes. right? And maybe RNAs, right? So we see that, you know, the, the RNA viruses are certainly, you know, very well established sort of, uh, you know, group of molecular machines, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a very interesting question. You know? What, what yeah. probability would you put? Like, how hard is this job? Like, are, how unlikely just on earth do you think this whole thing is that we got going? Like, is that, are we really lucky or is it inevitable? Like, what's your sense when you sit back and think about life on earth? Is it higher or lower than 1%? Well, cause 1% is pretty low, but it still is like, damn, that's a pretty well, good chance. Yes, it's it's a pretty good chance. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I would personally, but again, you know, uh, I'm, um, you know, probably You're... not the best person to, 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 to do such estimations, but uh, I would, you know, intuitively I would, probably put it lower. lower, but still, I mean, you know, given- So we're really lucky here on earth. Uh, I mean- Or the conditions are really good. It's I mean, just, that's you know, I think that there was, everything was right in a way, right? So, so we still, it's not, the, the conditions were not like ideal. If you try to, to look at, you know, what was, you know, several billions years ago when the life emerged, so there, there is something called uh, the rare earth hypothesis that, you know, in counter to the Drake equation says that the, you know, the conditions of earth, if you actually were to describe earth, it's quite a special place. So special it might be unique in our galaxy and potentially, you know, close to unique in the entire universe. Like it's very difficult to reconstruct those same conditions. And what the rare earth hypothesis argues is all those different conditions are essential for life. And so that's, the, that's sort of the counter, you know, like all the things we, you know, thinking that earth is pretty average. Um, I mean, I can't really, I'm trying to remember to, to go through all of them, but just the fact that it um, is shielded from 
a lot of asteroids, the obviously the distance to the sun, but also the fact that it's um, it's like a perfect balance between the amount of water and land and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, there's a bunch of different factors that uh, I, don't, I don't remember, there's a long list. But it's fascinating to think about if, uh, if, it, if uh, in order for something like proteins and then the DNA and RNA to, to emerge, you need, um, and basic living organisms, you need to be a very close and Earth-like planet, yeah. which would be sad. Or, well, or exciting, I don't know yeah. which. Uh... If you ask me, I, you know, in a way I put a parallel between, um, you know, between our own research. Uh, and I mean, from the, from the intuitive perspective, you know, you have those two extremes and the reality is never very rarely yeah. <laughs> falls into the extremes. It's yeah. always the optimums always reached somewhere in between. So, so I would, so, and that's what I tend to think. I think that, uh, you know, we're probably somewhere in between. So they yeah. were not unique, unique, but again, the chances are, you know, reasonably small. The problem is we don't know the, the other extreme is like, I tend to think that, that we don't actually understand the basic mechanisms of like what this is all originated from. Like, it seems like we think of life as this distinct thing, maybe intelligence is a distinct thing, maybe the physics that from which planets and suns are born is a distinct thing, but that could be a very, it's like the Stephen Wolfram thing. It's like the, from simple rules emerges greater and greater complexity. So, I, you know, I tend to believe that just life finds a way. It Like, we don't know the extreme of how common life is, because it could be life is like, everywhere <laughs> like like so everywhere that it's almost like laughable like that we're such idiots to think we're you like it's, it's it's like ridiculous to even like think it's like ants thinking th that their little colony is the unique thing and everything else doesn't exist i mean it, it's also very possible that that's uh that's the extreme and we're just not able to maybe comprehend the nature of that uh life, I mean, just to stick on alien life for just a brief moment more, is there is some signs of uh, signs of life on Venus in gaseous form. There's uh, hope for life on Mars, probably extinct. We're not talking about intelligent life. <laughs> Although that has been in the news recently. <laughs> We're talking about basic like, you know, uh, bacteria. Protobacteria. Yeah. Uh, and then also, I guess, uh, there's a couple moons that are, I guess. Europe. Uh, yeah, Eu Europa, which is Jupiter's moon. Yep. I think there's another one. Are you, um, is that exciting or is it terrifying to you that we might find life? Do you hope we find life? I certainly do hope that we find life. Um, I mean, it was very exciting to to hear about, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, news about the the possible life on Venus. It'd be nice to have hard evidence of something with, uh, which is what the hope is for for Mars and, and uh, Europa. But do you think those organisms would be similar biologically or would they even be sort of carbon-based if we do find them? I would say they, they would be carbon-based. Uh, how similar, it's a big question, right? So it's, it's, you know, the moment we discover things outside Earth, right? Even if it's a tiny little single cell, I mean, there is so much. Just imagine that, that would it's, be so. <laughs> I, I think that that would be another turning point for, yeah. for the science, you know? And if, especially if it's different in some very new way, that's exciting. Cause that says, that's a definitive state, not a definitive, but a pretty strong statement that life is everywhere in the, in the, in the universe. To me, at least, that's that's really exciting. You brought up Joshua Letterberg in an offline conversation. I think I'd love to talk to you about AlphaFold, and this might be an interesting way to enter that conversation because, uh, so he won the 1958 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discovering that bacteria can mate and exchange genes, but uh, he also did a ton of other stuff, like, uh, like we mentioned, uh, helping NASA find life on Mars and uh, 
the uh, dendro, ke- dendro, the, the the chemical expert system, expert systems. Remember those? Uh, do you uh, what do you find interesting about this guy and his his ideas about artificial intelligence in general? So I have a kind of personal uh, story to um, to share. So I started my PhD in, in Canada back in 2000. And so essentially my, my PhD was, uh, so we were developing sort of a, a new language for symbolic uh, machine learning. So it's different from the feature-based machine learning. And, and the, uh, one of the sort of uh, cleanest applications of this, uh, you know, of, of this approach of this formalism was uh, to uh, chem informatics and computer-aided drug design. Right, so, so, so essentially, we were, uh, you know, as so a part of my research, um, uh, I developed a system that essentially looked at uh, chemical compounds of, say, the same therapeutic category, you know, um, male hormones, right, and try to uh, figure out uh, the structural fragments that are the structural building blocks that are important that define this class versus structural building blocks that are there just because, you know, they, to complete the structure. But they are not essentially the ones that make up the the chemical, the, the key chemical properties of this uh, therapeutic category. And, and uh, you know, uh, for me, it was something new. I was, I was trained as a, an applied mathematician, you know, as with some uh, machine learning background, but you know, computer aided drug design was completely a completely new territory. So because of that, I often uh, find myself asking lots of questions uh, on one of these sort of central uh, forums. Back then, there were you no know, no Facebooks or stuff like that. There was What's a forum. Com- uh, it's a, you know, <laughs> it's a forum. It's it's essentially it's like a bulletin board. Yeah. Right. Where, on where the internet. You, yeah. So you essentially you have a bunch of people and you post a question and you get you know an answer from you know different people and 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 back then this like, one of the most popular uh, forums was CCL. I think um, computational chemistry. Library, well, not library, but uh, something like that. But CCL, that that was the 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 forum. And there, I I you know I asked a lot was, of dumb questions. Yes, I asked <laughs> questions. Also, shared some some you know uh, some uh, information about our formulas and how we do and whether what whatever we do makes sense. And so you know, and uh, I remember that you know, one of these posts. I mean, I still remember. You know, uh, I uh, I would call it. Desperately looking for uh, for uh, a chemist advice, something like that, right? And so, so I post my uh, question. I explained, how, you know, how how my uh, our formalism is, what is what it does, and w- what kind of applications I'm planning to to do. And you know, and it was you know in the middle of the night, and you know I went back uh, you know, to bed, and and next morning have a phone call from my advisor who also looked at this forum it's like you won't believe uh, who replied to you and and it's like who and he said well you know th- there is a message uh, to you from joshua lederberg uh. and my reaction was like who is joshua lederberg <laughs> <laughs> Your advisor hung up. <laughs> <laughs> so, and essentially, jo- you know, Joshua wrote me that we we had conceptually similar ideas in in the Dendral pro- uh, project. You may want to look it up. Mm. And you know, and and we, I, we should also sorry, and as a side comment, say that even though he he won the Nobel Prize at a really young age in in fifty eight, but so he he was, I think, he was what thirty three. Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah. So anyway, so that's so hence hence in the nineties <laughs> responding to young whippersnappers on the on the CCL forum. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and and so 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 back then he was already very senior. I mean, he unfortunately passed away back in two thousand eight. Uh, but you know, uh, back in two thousand one, he was. I mean, he he was a professor emeritus at uh, Rockefeller University, and you know that was actually, believe it or not, one of the one of the uh, of uh, of the reasons I decided to join, uh, you know, as a postdoc, uh, the, the group of Andre Sale, who was at Rockefeller University, mm-hmm. with the hope that you know that I could actually you know uh, have a chance uh, to meet Joshua in person, and I met him 
very briefly, right? The, uh, just because he was walking, you know, uh, the, there's a little bridge that connects the sort of the research cam uh, campus with the um, with the uh, sort of skyscraper that the Rockefeller owns, the, where you know. Uh, postdocs and faculty and, and graduate students live, and so so I met him, you know, and had a very short uh, conversation, you know. But uh, so I, I started, you know, reading about Dendral, and I was amazed, you know. It's we're talking about 1960, yeah, right. The ideas were so profound. Well, so what's the fundamental ideas of it? The the reason to make this. It's even crazier. <laughs> so, so, so Lederberg wanted to make a system that would help him study the um, extraterrestrial molecules, right? So, so the idea was that you know the the way you study the extraterrestrial molecules is you do the mass spec analysis, mm -hmm. right? And so the mass spec gives you sort of bits numbers about essentially. Uh, Gives you the ideas about the possible fragments, or you know, atoms, uh, you know, and 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 maybe a little fragments, pieces of this molecule that make up the molecule, right? So now you need to sort of to uh, decompose this information and to figure out what was the whole mm -hmm. before you know it became became uh, fragments, bits and pieces, right? So so in order to make this, uh, you know, to have this tool, uh, the idea of Lederberg was to connect chemistry, computer science, and to design this so-called expert system that looks, that takes into account, that, that takes as an input the mass spec data, the possible the database of possible molecules, and essentially try to uh, sort of induce the molecule that would correspond to this spectra. Or, mm -hmm. you know, essentially the what this project ended up being uh, uh, was that, you know, it would provide a list of candidates that then a chemist would look at and 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 make final decision. So, but the original idea, I suppose, is to solve the entirety of this problem automatically. Yes. yes. So 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 he, uh, you know, so uh, so he uh, back then uh, he 60s. approached. <laughs> yes, believe that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's amazing. I mean, it still blows my mind. You know that. It's that's it's and this was essentially the 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 origin of the modern bioinformatics, cheminformatics, you know, back yeah. in the sixties. Yeah. Right. So that's that's you know, uh, you know, so every time you 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 deal with with projects like this, with the you know research like this, you just you know, uh, so the 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 power of of the of the you know intelligence of these people uh, is is just. You know, overwhelming. Do you think about expert systems? Is there uh, and why they kind of didn't become successful, especially in the space of bioinformatics, where it does seem like there's a lot of expertise in humans, and uh, you know, it's it's possible to see that a system like this could be made very useful. Right. And be built so up. it's it's actually it's a it's a great question, and and this is something. So you know, so. Uh, you know, uh, at my university, I teach artificial intelligence, and you know, we start the my, my first two lectures are on the history of AI, and, and there we, you know, we try to, uh, you know, go through the main stages of AI, and so you know, the question of why expert systems failed or became obsolete. It's actually a very interesting one, and there are, you know, if you uh, try to read the, you know, the historical perspectives, there are actually two lines of thoughts. One is that the they were uh, essentially not up to the expectations, and so therefore they were replaced, you know, uh, by by other things. Right. The other one was that uh, completely opposite one that they were too good and and as a result they essentially became sort of a household name and then 
essentially they they got transformed i mean the in both cases sort of the outcome was the same they evolved into something yeah right and that's what i you know if <laughs> if i look at this right so the modern machine learning yeah. right so so there's echoes it, in in the modern machine learning to i that. think so I think so because you know if if you think about this you know and how we design uh you know uh the most successful algorithms including alpha fold right you built in the knowledge about the domain uh that you study right so so you built in your expertise so speaking of alpha fold so deep minds alpha fold 2 recently uh was announced to have quote unquote solved protein folding um, how exciting is this to you? It's, it seems to be one of the one of the exciting things that have happened in 2020. It's an incredible accomplishment from the looks of it. What part of it is amazing to you? What part would you say is overhyped or maybe uh, misunderstood? Mm -hmm. It's definitely a very exciting achievement. To give you a little bit of perspective, right? So, uh, so in bioinformatics, we have um, several competitions. And so the way, you know, you often hear uh, how those competitions have been explained to uh, sort of to non-bioinformaticians is that, you know, they call it bioinformatics Olympic games. And there are several disciplines, right? So so, the, so the, the historical one of the first one was the discipline in predicting the protein structure, mm -hmm. predicting the 3D coordinates of the protein. But there are some others. So uh, the predicting protein functions, uh, predicting effects of uh, mutations, on protein functions, then uh, predicting uh, protein-protein interactions. Mm -hmm. So, so the original one was uh, CASP or a critical assessment of uh, of uh, protein structure, um, and um, the you know typically what uh, happens during these competitions is uh, you know scientists, experimental scientists. Uh, solve the, the structures, but don't put them into the protein data bank, which is the centralized database uh, that contains all the 3D coordinates. Instead, they hold it and uh, release protein sequences. And now the challenge of the community is to predict mm -hmm. the 3D structures of these proteins and then use the experimentally solved structure to assess which one is the closest one. Right. right, and this competition, by the way, just a bunch of different tangents. And maybe you can also say what is protein folding. Uh, and this competition, CASP competition, is so has become the gold standard, and that's what was used to say that protein folding was solved. So just to add a little, um, yeah, just a bunch. So if you can, whenever you say stuff, uh, maybe throw in some of the basics for the folks that might be outside Absolutely. of the field. Anyway, sorry. For, so, so, so yeah, so, you know, so the reason it's, it's um, you know, it's relevant to our understanding of protein folding is because, you know, we, we, we've yet to learn how the folding mechanistically works, right? So there are different hypotheses what happens to this fold? For example, uh, the, there is a hypothesis that the folding happens by, you know, in, in also in the modular fashion, mm -hmm. right? So that, you know, we, we have protein domains that get folded independently because uh, their structure is stable and then the whole protein structure uh, gets formed. But, you know, e within those domains, we also have uh, so-called secondary structure, the small alpha helices, beta sheets. So these are, you know, uh, uh, elements that are structurally stable. And so, uh, and the, the question is, you know, when they when do they get formed? Because some of the secondary structure elements, you have to have, uh, you know, a fragment in the beginning and say fra the fragment in the middle, right? So, so you cannot, potentially start having a, the, the full fold from the get-go, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so it's still, you know, it, it's still a big enigma what, what happens. We know that it, it's an extremely efficient and stable process, right? right so there's, there's this long sequence and the fold happens really quickly. Exactly. So well, that's it, really weird, right? And, 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 and it happens like the same way almost every time. So, exactly. Exactly. That's right. Really so, so, weird. How, so, so, that's freaking weird. <laughs> it's it's yeah. That's that's why it's it's, it's such a, an amazing thing. But most importantly, right? So it's you know. So when when you see the the the, the tra you know the translation process, right? So when you don't have the 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 whole uh, protein 
translated, right? It's still being translated, you know, uh, uh, getting out from the ribosome. You you already see some structural, you know, fragmentation. So so folding starts happening before the whole protein gets produced, mm-hmm. right? And so this is this is obviously you know one of the biggest questions in you know in modern molecular biology. Not not like maybe what happens like that's not that's bigger than the question of folding. That's the question of like. So like deeper fundamental idea of folding. Yes. Behind folding. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, so obviously if we are able to um, predict the end product yeah. of protein folding, we are one step closer to understanding sort of the mechanistics of the protein folding because we can then potentially look and, and start probing what are the critical parts of this process and what are not so critical part of this process. So we can start decomposing this, yeah. you know. So 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 in a way, this protein structure prediction algorithm can be can be used as a tool, mm-hmm. right? So so you change the the, the, the you know you, you modify the, the protein, you get back to, to this tool. It predicts. Okay, it's completely. It's completely unstable. Yeah. Which, uh, which aspects of the input will have a big impact on the exactly. output? Exactly. Exactly. So, so what happens is, you know, we typically have some sort of incremental uh, advancement. You know, each stage of this uh, CASP competition, you have groups with incremental advancement, and you know, historically. Uh, the top performing groups were, uh, you know, they were not using machine learning. They were using uh, very advanced biophysics combined with bioinformatics, combined with, you know, the the data mining. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, you know, that would enable them to obtain uh, protein structures of those proteins that don't have any structurally solved relatives. Because, you know, if we have uh, a- another protein, say the same protein, but coming from a different species, uh, we could potentially derive some ideas, and that's so-called homology or comparative modeling, where we'll derive some ideas from the previously known structures, and that would help us tremendously in, uh, you know, in uh, reconstructing the 3D structure uh, Overall, but what happens when we don't have these relatives? This is when it becomes really, really hard, right? So that's so-called de novo, uh, uh, you know, uh, de novo protein structure prediction. And in this case, those methods were uh, traditionally very good. But what happened in the in the last year? The original alpha fold came into, and over sudden, it's much better than everyone else. This, this is 2018. Yeah. Oh, the, and the competition is only every two years, um, I think. And and then, so, uh, you know, it was sort of kind of of a shockwave to, 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 to the bioinformatics community that, you know, we have like a state-of-the-art machine learning system that does, uh, you know, structure prediction. And and essentially what it does, you know, so, 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 you know, if you look at this, it actually predicts the context. So, you know, so so the, the, the process of uh, reconstructing the, the 3D structure starts by predicting the, the context between the different parts of the protein. Mm-hmm. And the context is essentially the parts of the proteins that are in a close proximity to each other. Right, so it, right. Uh, it actually the machine learning part seems to be estimating, you can correct me uh, if I'm, I'm wrong here, but it seems to be estimating the distance matrix, which is like the distance between the different parts. Yeah, so so we call it the contact map. Contact right. map. Right. So once you have the contact map, the reconstruction is becoming more straightforward. Yeah. Right. But so the contact map is the key. And so, so uh, you know, so that what happened. And uh, now we st- started seeing in this current stage, right? Well, in the, in the most recent one, we started seeing the emergence of these ideas mm-hmm. in other uh, people's works. Mm-hmm. Right. But yet here's, you know, Alpha Fold 2 yeah. that again outperforms everyone else. 
and also by introducing yet another wave of 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 the of the you know machine learning ideas. Yeah, uh, there does seem to be also an incorporation. First of all, the paper is not out yet, but there's a bunch of ideas already out. There does seem to be an in incorporation of this other thing. I don't know if it's something that you could speak to, which is like the incorporation of like other st structures, like evolutionary similar. Yes, st structures that are used to kind of give you hints. Yes, so so so, so evolutionary similarity uh, is something that we can detect at different levels, right? So uh, we know, for example, that uh, the structure of proteins is more conserved than the sequence. The sequence could be very different, but the structural shape mm -hmm. is actually still very conserved. So that's that's sort of the intrinsic property that you know, in a way, related to protein folds, you know, to the evolution of the you know of the protein uh, of proteins and protein domains, etc. But we know that. I mean, we there've been uh, multiple studies, and uh, you know, ideally, if you have structures, you know, you should use that information. However, sometimes we don't have this information. Instead, we have a bunch of sequences. Sequences we have a lot, right? So so we 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 have you know hundreds, thousands of uh you know different organisms sequenced, right? And by taking the same protein but in different organisms and aligning it, so making it, you know, making the corresponding positions aligned we can actually uh, say a lot about sort of what is conserved in this protein and therefore, you know, structurally more stable, what is diverse in this protein. So on top of that, we, we could provide sort of the information about the sort of the secondary structure of this protein, et cetera, et cetera. So this information is extremely useful and it's already there. So, so while it's tempting to, you know, to do a complete ab initio, so you just have a protein sequence and nothing else, the reality is such that we we are overwhelmed with this data. So why not use it? Mm -hmm. And so yeah, so I, uh, I'm looking forward to to reading the the this paper. It, it does seem to like they've in the previous version of AlphaFold they didn't. Uh, for this, the evolutionary similarity thing, they didn't use machine learning for that, or they rather they used it as like the input to the entirety of the the neural net, like the features uh, derived from the similarity. It seems like there's some kind of quote unquote iterative thing, where it seems to be um, part of the part of the learning process is the incorporation of this evolutionary similarity. Yeah, I, I don't think there is a bioarchive paper, right? There's nothing. No, there's nothing. nothing. Yeah, there's so, a blog so, post that's written by a marketing team, essentially. Yeah. Which, you know, it has some scientific uh, uh, similarity probably to the, the actual methodology used, but it could be, it's like interpreting scripture. It could yeah. it could be just poetic uh, interpretations of the actual work, as opposed to direct connection to the work. Yeah. So now speaking about protein folding, right? So 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 you know, in order to answer the question whether or not we we have solved this, right? Yeah. So we need to go back to to the beginning of our conversation, you know, with the realization that you know an average protein is that typically what uh, the the cusp. Uh, has been focusing on is uh, the you know the this competition has been focusing on the single maybe two domain proteins that are still very compact and even those ones are extremely challenging to to solve, right? But now we talk about you know an average protein that has two three protein domains. If you look at the um, proteins that uh, that are in charge of the you know uh, of the process in, you know, with the neural system right well, perhaps one of the uh, of the most recently evolved sort of uh, systems in 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 an organism right all of them well the majority of them are highly multi-domain proteins so they are you know some of them have five six seven, you know, uh, and more domains, right? And, you know, we are very far away from understanding how these proteins are folded. So the complexity of the protein matters here, the, complex the, the complexity of the protein modules or the, the protein domains. 
So you're saying uh, solved. So the definition of solved here is particularly the cast competition achieving human level, not human level, achieving experimental, uh, level. Uh, experimental level performance on these particular sets of proteins that have been used in these competitions. Well, I mean, you know, I I I, I do think that uh, you know, especially with with regards to the alpha fold, you know, it is able to uh, you know to solve, you know, at the near experimental level, a, a pretty big majority of the of the uh, more compact proteins, like or protein domains, because again, in order to understand how the overall protein, uh, uh, you know, multi-domain protein fold, we do need to understand the structure of its individual domains. I mean, unlike. If you look at alpha zero or like uh, even mu zero, if you look at that work, you know there it's nice reinforcement learning, self play mechanisms are nice because it's all in simulation, so you can learn from just huge amounts. Like you don't need data. It was like the problem with proteins, like the size. Uh, I forget how how, my, how many three D structures have been mapped, but the training data is very small. No matter what, it's like millions maybe a one or two million, something like that. But it's some very small number, but like, I, it doesn't seem like that's scalable. There has to be, I don't know, it feels like you want to somehow 10X the data or 100X the data somehow. It, yes, but we also can take advantage of, uh, of uh, homology models, right? So, so the models that are of very, Good quality because they are essentially um, obtained based on the evolutionary information, mm. right? So, so you can so there is a potential to enhance this information, and uh, you know use it again uh, to to empower the the uh, the training set. Um, and it's I think I I am actually very optimistic. I think it's been one of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, churning events where you have a system that is, you know, a machine learning system that is truly better than the sort of the more conventional biophysics based methods. Yeah, that's a huge leap. This is one of those fun questions, but uh, where would you put it in in the uh, ranking of the greatest breakthroughs in artificial intelligence history? Oh. So, like, okay, so let's let's see who's in the running. Maybe you can correct me. So, you got like Alpha Zero and Alpha Go beating, you know, beating the world champion at the game of Go, thought to be impossible like twenty years ago or at least the AI community was highly skeptical. Then you got like also Deep Blue original Kasparov. You have deep learning itself, like the maybe, what would you say, the AlexNet ImageNet moment. So the first neural network ach achieving human level performance, super not, that's not true. Achieving like a big leap in performance on the computer vision problem. Uh, there is, OpenAI, the whole like GPT-3, that whole space of transformers and language models just achieving this incredible performance uh, of application of neural networks to language models. Boston Dynamics, pretty cool. Like robotics, oh, yeah. even though people are like, there's no AI, uh, no, no, there's no machine learning currently. But uh, AI is much bigger than machine learning. Yes. So, so that just the engineering aspect, I would say, is one of the greatest accomplishments in engineering side. Engineering meaning like mechanical engineering of uh, robotics ever. Then, of course, autonomous vehicles. You can argue for Waymo, which is like the Google self-driving car, or you can argue for Tesla, which is like actually being used by hundreds of thousands of people on the road today, machine learning system. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can, what else, what, what else is there? But I think that's it. So, and then Alpha Fold, many people are saying is up there, potentially number one. Would you put them at number one? Well, in terms of the impact 
on on the science and on the society beyond is definitely you know to me would be one of the you know uh top big, three which maybe you want? i mean i'm i'm i yeah, yeah, yeah. I, i'm probably not the best person to to to, <laughs> to answer that you know but you know yeah. i uh you know i i do have i i remember my you know uh back in i think 1997 when deep blue but kasparov it was i mean it was a shock yeah. i mean it was and i think for the for the you know uh for the you know uh pre substantial part of the world that especially people who have some uh you know uh, some experience with chess right and realizing how incredibly human this game how you know how much of a brain power you need you know to to reach those you know those levels of uh, grandmasters right level yeah, and it's probably one of the first time and how good kasparov was and and again yeah so <laughs> kasparov is arguably one of the best ever right yeah. and you get a machine that beats him right so it's it's you know, first time a machine probably beat a human at that scale of a thing of anything yes yes so yeah. that was to me that was like you know one of the groundbreaking events in the history of AI. Yeah, it's probably number one. As I probably like we don't <laughs> it's it's hard to remember. It's like Muhammad Ali versus uh I don't know any of the Mike Tyson or something like that. It's like, nah, you gotta put Muhammad Ali at number one. Uh same yeah. with same with Deep Blue, even though it's not machine learning based. Uh but still it it uses advanced search and search yeah. is the integral part of AI, yeah. right so it's as, not as you it's, said it's, people don't think of it that way not at this moment in vogue currently search is not seen as a as a fundamental aspect of intelligence but it very well I and mean, it very likely is in fact i mean that's what neural networks are is they're just performing search on the space of parameters and it's all search <laughs> all, uh, all of intelligence is some form of search and you just have to become clever and clever at that search problem and i also have uh, another one that you didn't mention that's 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 uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, so you probably heard of this it's uh, i think it's called deep rembrandt it's the mm. project where they they uh, trained uh, i think there was a collaboration between the uh, sort of the uh, experts in in rembrandt uh, painting in netherlands and a group an artificial intelligence group where they train an algorithm to replicate the style mm. of the rembrandt and they actually printed a a, a pro portrait that never existed before mm. uh in the style of rembrandt they they uh I think they printed it on a on a sort of uh on the canvas that you know using pretty much same types of paints and stuff uh, to me it was mind blowing yeah it's you know, in the space of art that's interesting there hasn't been um maybe that's that's it but I I think there hasn't been an image in that moment yet in the space of art you haven't been able to achieve superhuman level performance in the space of art even though there was, you know, there's a big famous thing where there was per, a piece of art was purchased, I guess, for a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But it's still, you know, people are like in the space of music, at least. Um, that's, you know, it's clear that human created pieces are much more popular. So there hasn't yeah. been a moment where it's like, oh, this is, we're now, I, I would say in the space of music, what makes a lot of money. We're talking about serious money. It's music and movies or like shows and so on and entertainment. There hasn't been a moment where AI created, uh, AI was able to create a piece of music or a piece of uh, cinema or like Netflix show that is, uh, you know, that's sufficiently popular to make a, sh a ton of money. Yeah. And that moment would be very, very powerful. Cause that's like a, that's an AI system being used to make a lot of money. And like direct, of course, AI tools, like even Premiere, audio editing, all the editing, everything I do, to edit this podcast, there's a lot of AI involved. I want, actually, there's this a program, I wanna talk to those folks just cause I wanna nerd out. It's called Isotope. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They have a bunch of tools of audio processing uh -huh. and they have, I think they're Boston based. Just, it's so exciting to me to to use it like on the audio here. 
because it's all machine learning. It's not because most audio, most audio production stuff is like any kind of processing you do is very basic signal processing and you're tuning knobs and so on. They have all of that, of course, but they also have all of this machine learning stuff, like where you actually give it training data. You mm -hmm. select parts of the audio you train on, you you, you train on it, and it it uh, figures stuff out. It's it's great. It's able to detect, uh, like the the ability of it to be able to d separate voice and music, for example, or voice and anything is incredible. Like it it just. It's clearly exceptionally good at uh, you know applying these different neural networks models to 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 separate the different kinds of signals from the audio. That that uh, okay, so that's really exciting. Photoshop, Adobe people also use it, but to generate a piece of music yeah. that will sell art. millions, yeah. a piece of art, yeah. I, I, no, I I agree, and you know it's uh, that's that's you know. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I offer my my AI class, and you know, an integral part of this is a project, right? So it's it's my favorite, ultimate favorite part because it typically we have these you know project presentations the last two weeks of the class. It's right before you know the the Christmas break, and it's it's sort of it adds this cool excitement. And every time, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm amazed, you know, with with some uh, some projects that people uh you know come up with and so uh and quite a few of them are actually you know they some have some link to uh to to arts i mean you know i think last year uh we had a group who designed an ai uh producing uh hokus japanese poems oh wow uh so and some of them so you know it got trained on the on the english the based haikus haikus right so um and and some of them you know they get to present like the the top selection they were pretty good i mean you know <laughs> i mean of course i'm not i'm not a specialist but yeah. you you read them and you see it this seems rhythm. profound <laughs> yes yeah it it, it seems the reason so it's it's kind of cool uh, uh we, we also had a couple of projects where people tried to to uh, teach uh, ai how to play like rock music mm -hmm. classical music uh i think and uh, and and popular music yeah. uh interestingly enough uh you know classical music was among the most difficult ones oh, sure. and 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 you know of course, if you if you know uh, you know if if you look at the you know the at, at like grand masters of music like Bach, right? So there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of almost math. Yeah, the, well, he's very mathematical. Yeah, exactly. Right? So so this is I would imagine that yeah, at least some style of this music could be picked up. But then you have this completely different spectrum of of you know uh, classical composers, and so we, you know it, it and you know it, it's almost like you know you don't have to sort of look at the data. You just listen to it and say, nah, that's 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 not it, not yet. That's not it. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's how I feel too. There's uh, OpenAI has I think Open Muse or something like that. The system, it's cool, but it's like, yeah. It's not compelling for some for some reason. It could be a psychological reason too. Maybe we need to have a human being, a tortured soul behind the music. I don't know. Yeah, no, that, that absolutely. I, I completely agree. But yeah, whether or not we'll have a, one day, we'll have you know a song written by an AI engine to to be in like in top charts. Yeah, musical charts. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I wonder if we already have one and it just hasn't been announced. <laughs> <laughs> we we wouldn't know. How hard is the multi-protein folding problem? Is that kind of something you've already mentioned, which is baked into this idea of greater and greater complexity of proteins? Like multi-domain proteins, does that basically become multi-protein so like complexes it's, it's yes you you got it right so so it's sort of it has the components of both of protein folding and protein protein interactions 
because in order for these domains, I mean, many of these uh, proteins actually, they never form a stable structure. Uh, you know, one of my favorite proteins, you know, and uh, pretty much everyone who who works in the, I know, uh, who I, whom I know who works in the, you know, uh, with proteins, they always have their favorite proteins, right? <laughs> so, so, so one yeah. of my favorite proteins, uh, probably my favorite protein, the <laughs> one that I worked uh, when I was a postdoc is uh, so-called post-synaptic density 95, PSD 95 protein. So it's, uh, it's one of the key actors in uh, in the majority of uh, neurological processes at the molecular level, so it's a, a and it essentially it's a it's a key player in the postsynaptic density. So this is the crucial part of the uh, synapse where you know a lot of these uh, key molecular processes are happening. So it's it has five domains, right? So mm -hmm. five protein domains. So it, Pretty, you know, uh, large proteins. Uh, I think uh, six hundred something uh, amino acids. Uh, but you know, the way it's organized itself, it's flexible, right? So it acts as a scaffold. So it is used to bring in mm -hmm. other proteins. So they start acting in the orchestrated manner, right? So and. The, the type of the shape of this protein, it's in a way there are some stable parts of this uh, protein, but there are some flexible. And this flexibility is built in into the protein in order to become sort of this multifunctional uh, machine. So do you think that kind of thing is also learnable through the alpha fold two kind of approach? I mean, the time will tell. Is it another level of complexity? Like, it, is it is it uh like how big of a jump in complexity is that whole thing? To me, it's it's yet another level of complexity because when we talk about uh, protein protein interactions, and there is actually a, a a different challenge for this called Capri, and so this that is focused uh, spe specifically on macromolecular interactions, protein 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 DNA etc. So, uh, but it's uh, you know there are different mechanisms uh, that govern molecular interactions and that need to be picked up, say, by a machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, interestingly enough, we actually, we participated uh, for a few years in this competition. We typically don't participate in competitions. Uh, I don't know, uh, 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 don't have enough time, you know, because uh, it's very intensive. It's, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, it's, it's a very intensive process. But we participated uh, back in, um, you know, about 10 years ago or so. And the way we entered this competition, so we design a scoring function, right? So the function that evaluates whether or not your protein, protein interaction is supposed to look like experimentally solved, right? So the scoring function is very critical part of the, of the uh, model prediction. So we designed it to be a machine learning one. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was one of the first machine learning based scoring function used in Capri. And, uh, you know, we essentially, you know, learned what should contribute, what are the critical components contributing into the protein-protein interactions. So this, this this could be converted into a learning problem and thereby it could be, it could be learned. I believe so, yes. Do you think AlphaFold 2 or something similar to it from DeepMind or somebody else will be, will result in a Nobel Prize or multiple Nobel Prizes? So like the, you know, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, you can't give a Nobel Prize <laughs> to, to a computer program. Uh, you, at least for now, give it to the designers of that program. But is do you see one or multiple Nobel Prizes where AlphaFold 2 is like a large percentage of what that prize is given for? Would it lead to discoveries at the level of Nobel Prizes? I mean, I think we are definitely destined to see the Nobel Prize becoming sort of, to be evolving 
with the evolution of science. And the evolution of science is such that it now becomes like really multifaceted, right? So where you have you don't really have like a unique discipline. You have sort of the the uh, a lot of cross dis disciplinary talks in order to achieve uh, sort of you know really big advancements, uh, you know. So I think you know, the computational methods will be acknowledged in one way or another. And in, in as a matter of fact, uh, you know, they were first acknowledged back in 2013, right? Where, we, you know, the, the first uh, three uh, people uh, were, uh, you know, awarded the, the, the Nobel Prize for the protein, for study the protein folding, right? The principle. And, you know, I think all three of them are computational biophysicists. Mm. Right, so um, you know that I think is is unavoidable. You know, it, it will come with the time. Um, the fact that you know alpha fold and you know similar approaches, because again, it's a matter of time that people will embrace the this uh, you know principle and we'll see more and more such, uh, you know, uh, such tools coming into play. But, uh, you know, these methods will be critical in uh, in a scientific discovery, no, no doubts about it. On the engineering side, maybe a dark question, but do you think it's possible to use these machine learning methods to start to engineer proteins? And the next question is, uh, something uh, quite a few biologists are against, some are for, for study purposes, is to engineer viruses. Do you think machine learning, like something like AlphaFold could be used to engineer viruses? So to answering the first question, you know, it has been, you know, a part of the research in the protein science, the protein design is, you know, is uh, a very prominent areas of research, of course, you know, one of the pioneers is David Baker and Rosetta algorithm that, you know, essentially was doing the, the, the Nova design and was used to design new proteins, you know. And design of proteins means design of function. So like when you design a protein, you can control, I mean, the whole point of a protein, with the protein structure comes a function, like Correct. it's doing something. Correct. So you Correct. can design yes. different things. That so you so can you do. can yeah. So you can do, uh, well. You can look at the proteins from the functional perspective. You can also look at the proteins from the structural perspective, right? So the structural building blocks. So if you want to have a building block of a certain shape, you can try to achieve it. Yes. By you know introducing a new pro uh, protein sequence and predicting, you know, uh, how it will fold. Mm -hmm. So uh, so with that, I mean, it's it's a natural uh, one of the you know, natural uh, applications of these algorithms. Uh, now, talking about engineering a virus. With machine learning. With machine learning, right? So, so well, um, you know, so luckily for us, I mean, uh, we don't have that much data, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, we actually, you know, right now, one of the projects that we are uh, carrying on in the lab is we we we're, we're trying to develop a machine learning uh, algorithm that uh, determines the uh, whether or not the, the current strain is pathogenic, and the current strain of the coronavirus of, of the no, of the virus. I mean, so so there, there are applications oh, to yeah. coronaviruses because we have strains of SARS-CoV-2, also SARS-CoV, MERS that are pathogenic, but we also have strains of other coronaviruses that are you know not. Pathogenic. I mean, the the common cold uh, viruses and uh, you know and, and some other ones, right? So so uh, pathogenic meaning spreading. Oh, uh, path pathogenic me means actually infli inflicting damage. damage. Correct. Uh, there are also some you know seasonal versus pandemic strains of influenza, right? And to determining the what are the molecular determinant, right? So that are built in into the protein sequence into the gene sequence, right? So, and uh, whether or not the machine learning can determine those deter uh, those components, right? Oh, interesting. So like using machine learning to, that's really interesting to, to, to given 
give the input is like uh, what the protein entire sequence. the the protein sequence, and then determine if this thing is going to be able to do damage to yeah. to a to a biological system. Yeah. So so I mean, it's a good so machine learning. You're saying we don't have enough data for that. We I mean for for this specific one we do uh, we might. Actually, I ha you know have to back up on this because we, we're still in the process. There was uh, one uh, work uh, that appeared in Bioarchive by Eugene Kunin, who is one of these you know uh, pioneers in uh, in in evolutionary genomics, um, and they tried to look at this, uh, but uh, you know the the methods were sort of standard, uh, you know supervised learning uh, methods, uh, and now the question is, you know, can you, you know advance it f further by by using you know not so standard methods you know so there's obviously a lot of hope in in transfer learning where you mm -hmm. can actually try to transfer the information that the, the machine learning learns about the proper protein sequences right and uh, you know so so there is some promise in going this direction but if we have this it would be extremely useful because then we could essentially forecast the potential mutations that would make a current strain hmm. more or less pathogenic uh, right? anticipate uh, exactly. anticipate them exactly. from a vaccine development That's, for the treatment to anti uh, any viral drug development that so, that would yeah. be a very crucial task but you could also use that system to then say how would we potentially modify this virus to make it more pathogenic? This, th that's true, that's true. I mean, uh, you know, the, again, the hope is, well, several things, right? So, so one is that, you know, it's, even if you design a, you know, a, a sequence, right? So to carry out the actual experimental biology, to ensure that mm -hmm. all the com components working, you know, is is a completely different matter. A difficult process. Yes. Uh, then the the you know uh, we've seen in the past the there could be some regulation of the the, the moment the scientific community yes. recognizes that it's now becoming no longer a sort of a a, a fun puzzle to you know for for yeah. machine learning could be well, open. Yeah. So so then there might be some regulation. So. I, I think back in what 2015, there was you know the, there was an issue on regulating the uh, the research on uh, on influenza strains, right? That there were, were you know several groups uh, you know use sort of uh, mutation analysis to to determine uh, whether or not this strain will jump from one species to another. And I think there was like a half a year mor moratorium on 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 the research and on the paper published until you know. Uh, scientists, you know, analyzed it and decided that it's actually safe. Um, I forgot what that's called. Something of function, test of function. Gain Let's of function, loss gain, of function. Gain of function, yeah, yeah. Gain of function, loss of function, that's right, sorry. Uh, it's, it's like, let's watch this thing mutate for a while to see like, to see what kind of things we can observe. Um, I guess, I'm not so much worried about that kind of research if there's a lot of regulation and if it's done very well and, with, with competence and seriously. I am more worried about kind of this, uh, you know, the, the the underlying aspect of this question is more like 50 years from now. Uh, speaking to the Drake equation, one, one of the parameters in the Drake equation is how long civilizations last. And that's that seems to be the most important value actually for calculating if there's other alien intelligent civilizations out there. That's where there's most variability. Uh, assuming like if life, if that percentage that life can emerge is like not zero, like if we're like, super unique, then it's the how long we last is, is basically the most important thing. So I'm, from, from a selfish perspective, but also from a Drake uh, equation perspective, I'm worried about the la our civilization lasting. And you kind of think about all the ways in which machine learning can be used to design greater weapons of destruction, right? And I mean, one way to ask that, if you look sort of 50 years from now, 100 years from now, would you be more worried about natural pandemics or engineered pandemics? 
like who's who's the better designer of viruses, nature or humans? If we look down the line, I I think uh, in my view, I would still be worried about the natural pandemics, simply because I mean the the capacity uh, of the nature producing. Yeah, this it does is, pretty good job, right? Yes. And the motivation for using virus engineering viruses for uh, as a weapon is a weird one because uh, maybe you can correct me on this, but it's very it seems very difficult to target a virus, right? The whole point of a weapon, the way a rocket works, you have a starting point, you have an end point, and you you're trying to hit a target. To to hit a target with a virus is very difficult. It's basically just right. It it's the, the target would be the human species. <laughs> Oh man, yep. yeah. I have a I have a hope in us. I'm forever optimistic that we will not. There's no. There's insufficient evil in the world to do, to lead that to that kind of destruction. Well, uh, you know, I also hope that. I mean, that's what we see. I mean, uh, with the way we are getting connected, the world is getting connected. I think it it helps for the world to become more transparent. Yeah. So so the information spread is you know I think it's one of the key things for the for the society to become more balanced. Yeah. One way or another. This is something that people disagree with me on, but I do think that uh the kind of secrecy the governments have. So you're kind of speaking more to the other aspects like uh research community being more open, companies are being more open. Uh, government is still like, uh, <laughs> uh, we're talking about like military secrets. Yeah. I think I think military secrets of the kind that could destroy the world will become also a thing of the 20th century. It'll become more and more open. Yeah. Like I, I think nations will lose power in the 21st century, like lose sufficient power to where secrecy is, transparency is more beneficial than secrecy, but. Of course, it's not obvious. Let's, uh, let's hope so. Let's hope so that that you know the 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 um, the governments will become more transparent. What? So we last talked, I think, in March or April. What have you learned? How is your philosophical, psychological, biological worldview changed since then? Or you've been studying it nonstop from a computational biology perspective. How has your understanding and thoughts about this virus changed over those months the, yeah. from the beginning to today? One thing that uh, I was really amazed at how efficient the scientific community was. I mean, and uh, you know, even just judging uh, on on this very narrow domain of you know uh, protein structure, you know, understanding the structural. Uh, characterization of of this virus from the components point of view of the, you know whole virus point point of view you know if you look at at SARS right the the something that happened you know oh, less than 20 but you know uh, close enough 20 years ago and you see what you know when it happened you know what was sort of the response to uh, by the scientific community you see that the the structural characterizations did a cure, but it took several years, right? Now, the things that took several years, it's a matter of months, mm -hmm. right? So, so we we see that you know the, the 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 research pop up. We are at the unprecedented level in terms of the sequencing, right? Never uh, before we had a single virus sequence so many times, you know, so which allows us to actually to trace very precisely the sort of the evolutionary nature of this virus, what happens, and it's not just the, you know, uh, this virus independently of everything, it's, you know, it's the, you know, the, the sequence of this virus linked, anchored to the specific ge geographic place, yeah. to specific people because you know yeah. the, the the our genotype influences also you know the the evolution of this you know it's it's always a host pathogen co-evolution that that you know occurs it'd be cool if we also had a lot more data about 
so that the spread of this virus, uh, not maybe, well, it'd be nice if we had it for like contact tracing purposes for this virus, but it'd be also nice if we had it for the study for future viruses to be able to respond and so on. But, well, yeah, but it's already nice that we have geographical data and like exactly. basic data from individual humans. Yeah, exactly. I, no, I think uh, contact tracing is, is, is obviously a key uh, component in understanding the spread of this virus. Uh, we, there is also there is a number of challenges, right? So X Prize is one of them. We we uh, you know uh, just recently to, you know uh, took a part of uh, this competition. It's the prediction of the uh, of the uh, number of infections in different regions. Oh, sure. um, so and you know obviously the the AI is the main topic uh, in in those predictions. Yeah, but it's still. The data, I mean, that's that's a competition, but the the data is weak on the training. <laughs> like it's it's great. It's much more than probably before, but like it would be nice if it was like really rich. Like I I, I talked to uh, Michael Mina from uh, from Harvard. I mean, he dreams that the community comes together with like a weather map to where of viruses, right? Like really high resolution mm -hmm. sensors on like how from person to person the viruses that travel, all the different kinds of viruses, right? Yeah. Because there's 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 a ton of them. And then you'd be able to tell the story that uh, you've spoken about of the evolution of these viruses, like day-to-day -day <laughs> mutations that are occurring. I mean, that'd be fascinating just uh, from a perspective of study and from the perspective of being able to respond to future pandemics. That's ultimately what I'm worried about. Um, People love books. Uh, is there is there some uh, three or whatever number of books, technical fiction, philosophical, that uh, that uh, brought you joy in life, had an impact on your life, and maybe some that you would uh, recommend others? So I'll give you three very different books, and I also have a special runner up uh, and uh, honorable mention. <laughs> uh, the, it's uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, it's it's an audio book, and that's this. Ah. Yeah, I, there's some specific reason behind that. Okay. So um, you know, so the first book is you know something that uh, sort of impacted my earlier stage of life, and I'm probably not going to be very original here. Uh, it's Bulgakov's Master and Margarita. Nice. So that's probably you know. <laughs> Well, not for a Russian, maybe it's not super original, but it's, yeah. you know, it's it's a really powerful book for uh, even in English. So I read it, it is, in English, so. It is incredibly powerful. And I mean, it's the the way it ends, right? So it's, it's I, I I still have goosebumps when I read the, the, the very last sort of, the, it's called prologue, where uh, it, it's just so powerful. What impact did, you, did it have on you? What ideas, what insights did you get from it? I was just taken by, you know, by the the fact that you have those parallel lives apart from many centuries, right? And somehow they they got sort of intertwined mm -hmm. into one story, and and that's to me was fascinating. And uh, you know, of course, the you know the romantic part of this book is like you know, it's not just you know, romance, it's like the romance empowered by sort of magic, right? Mm -hmm. And and that and 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 maybe on top of that you have some irony, which unavoidable, right? So because it it was that, you know, the the Soviet time and, But it's very it's very it's deeply Russian. So that's um yes. the the wit, the humor, the, the pain, the the love, all of that is um one of the books that kind of captures something about Russian culture that people outside of Russia should probably read. I agree. I what's agree. Uh, what's the second so, one? So the second one is again, another one that uh, it happened, uh, I, I read it uh, later in my life. I think uh, I read it first time when I was a, a, a graduate student and that's uh, the Solzhenitsyn's uh, Cancer Ward. That is amazingly powerful book. It's, what is it about? It's about, I mean, essentially based on, on uh, you know, Solzhenitsyn uh, uh, was diagnosed with cancer when he was reasonably young and he, he made a full recovery. But, uh, you know, so, so this is about a, a, a person 
who was sentenced for life in one of these, uh, you know, uh, camps. Um, and uh, he had some cancer. So he was, uh, you know, uh, transported back to one of these uh, uh, Soviet republics, I think it was, you know, South Asian uh, republics. And uh, the, the book is about, you know, his experience being a, a prisoner, being a, you know, a patient in the cancer uh, clinic in a cancer ward, surrounded by people, many of which die, right? Uh, but in a way, you know, the way, I, you know, it reads, I mean, first of all, I, later on, I, I uh, read the, the accounts of the, of the doctors who described these, you know, the, the experiences, uh, you know, uh, in the book by the patient as, as incredibly accurate. Right, so so you know, I I read that there was you know some doctors saying that you know uh, every single doctor should read this book to understand what the patient feels, but you know, again, as many of the Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn's books, it has multiple levels of complexity, and obviously the the you know if you look above the cancer and the patient, I mean the 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 tumor that was growing and then disappeared in in in, in his uh you know uh in his body with some consequences i mean this is you know allegorically the soviet <laughs> yeah. and and you know and he actually he he agreed you know when he was asked he, he said that this is what make him think about this, you know, how to combine these experiences. Huh. Him being a part of the, you know, of the Soviet regime, also being a part of the, of the, you know, of someone sent to the, to, to Gulag camp, right? Yeah. And also someone who, exper cancer. who experienced cancer in his life. You know, the, uh, the Gulag archipelago and this book, these are the works that, actually made him uh you know receive a nobel prize but you know to me i i've uh you know i've read different other uh, you know uh books by solzhenitsyn this one is to me is the most powerful one that I and read. by the way both this one and the previous one you read in russian yes yes so now there is the third book is is an English book and it's completely different. So, so you know, we're, we're switching the gears completely. Uh, so this is the book, which it, it's not even a book. It's a it's an essay by uh, John von Neumann oh, wow. called The Computer and the Brain. And that was the, the book he was writing knowing that uh, he, he was dying of cancer. Wow. So, so the book was released back. It, it's a very thin book. Right, but uh, the the power, the intellectual power in in this book, in this essay, is incredible. I mean, you probably know that uh, von Neumann is considered to be one of these biggest thinkers, right? So the, the his intellectual power was incredible, right? And you can actually feel this power in this book, where you know the person is writing, knowing that he will be, you know he will die. It's, the book actually got published only after his death back in, in 1958. He died in 1957. And, but so, so he tried to put as many ideas that, you know, he still, you know, uh, hadn't realized. And, you know, so, so this book is very difficult to read because, you know, every single paragraph is just compact. You know, is is uh, uh, filled with these ideas, and you know the ideas are incredible. Um, even nowadays, you, you know, so so he tried to put the parallels between the brain computing power, the neural system, and the computers. You know, as they were Do you understood. Remember what year he was working on? It's like approximately uh, fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. So so that was right during his, you know, when he was diagnosed with cancer and he was essentially. Yeah, he's one of those, um, there's a few folks people mention, I think Ed Witten is another, that like everybody, everyone that meets them, they say he's just an intellectual powerhouse. 
Yes. Okay, so and who is the honorable mention? So, the so, so, and this is, I mean, the reason I put it sort of in a separate section because this is a book that I reasonably listened, uh, recently listened to. Mm -hmm. So, so it's an audio book, and this is a book called Lab Girl mm -hmm. by Hope Jaren. So Hope Jaren, is, she is a, uh, a scientist. She is a geochemist uh, mm -hmm. that essentially studies um, uh, the uh, the fossil uh, plants, and so she so uses the this fossil plant, uh, the the chemical analysis to understand what was the climate back in you know mm. in thousand years, you know, hundreds of thousands That's years cool. ago, and so. Something that incredibly touched me by this book. It was narrated by the author. Nice. And it's Excellent. an incredibly personal story. Incredibly. So certain parts of the book, you could actually hear the author crying. And that to me, I mean, I, I never experienced anything like this, you know, reading the book, but it was like, you know, the the connection between you and the author. And I think this is, you know, this is really a must read, but even better, a must listen, must listen. Uh, to uh, audio book for anyone who wants to learn about sort of, you know, acad academia, science, research in general, mm -hmm. because it's a very personal account about her uh, becoming a scientist. So uh, we're, we're just before New Year's. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about some difficult topics of viruses and so on. Do you have some exciting things uh, you're looking forward to in 2021? Uh, some New Year's resolutions, maybe silly or fun, um, or uh, something very important and fundamental to the world of science or something completely unimportant? Mm. Well, well, I'm I'm definitely looking f forward to towards you know things becoming normal, <laughs> right? So uh, yes, so I I really miss traveling. Uh, every summer, I go to a international summer school. It's, it's called the School for Molecular and Theoretical Biology. It's held in Europe. And it's organized by very good friends of mine, and this is the co the school for gifted kids. Uh, from all over the world, and they're incredibly bright. It's like every time I go there, it's like you know, it's 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 a highlight of the year. Um, and you know, we couldn't make it this August, so we we did this school remotely. But it's it's different. It's so some I am uh, definitely looking forward to next August uh, coming there. I also, I mean, you know, one of the one of my you know, uh, personal resolutions. I I realized that you know, being in uh, you know in house and working from from home, um, you know, I realized that that actually I apparently missed a lot. You know, spending time with my family, believe it or not. Yeah. So so you 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 typically you know with, with all the research and uh, you know and and teaching and. Everything re related to the academic life, uh, I mean, you get distracted, and so so uh, you know you don't feel that you know the fact that you are away from your family doesn't affect you because you are you know naturally distracted by other yeah. things, and uh, you know this time I I realized that you know that that's so important, right? So spending your time with the with the family with your kids. And so I'm, uh, that that would be my uh, New Year resolution in actually sp trying to spend as much time as possible, even when the world opens up. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a beautiful message. That's a beautiful reminder. I asked you if uh, if there's a Russian poem you could read uh, that I could force you to read, and you said, "Okay, fine, sure." Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you mind Do you mind reading? And you're sure. like, you said that no paper needed. So nope. So yeah, so the this poem was written by my namesake, another Dmitri, Dmitri Kemerfeld, um, and uh, is a you know it's a recent poem yeah, and it's uh, it's called uh, Sorceress, Vedma, uh, in in Russian uh, or actually 
Kaldunia. So that's sort of another sort of uh, connotation of, of sorceress or uh, witch. Uh, and I really like it. And it's one of just a handful of poems I actually can recall by heart. I also have a very strong association when I read this poem with uh, Master Margarita, the, 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 the main uh, female character, uh, Margarita. Um, and also it's, you know, it's about, you know, it's happening about the same time we're talking uh, now. So around New Year, <laughs> around Christmas. Do you mind uh, reading it in Russian? I'll give it a try. В белой вьюге, белой зыбе, белой мгле, На распятии сопящих городов Ты, безумная, летала на метле, Зябко ежась от январских холодов. Пах сочельник апельсином и треской, Ветер вялил новогодние шары, И подластны твоей силе колдовской Гибли души и кручинились миры. Так ты узила глаза свои, ерясь, что любой, кому спускалась благодать, был готов за эту ведьминскую связь без оглядки душу дьяволу отдать. На погостах веселилось воронье, ну а я, без предрассудков и рубах, выбегал, чтобы почувствовать твое изумленное дыхание на губах, чтобы кожей, языком, ребром крутым на чужой, уже на призрачной земле вспоминать Как над землей летала ты в белой вьюге, белой зыбе, белой мгле. That's beautiful. I love how it captures a a moment of longing and uh, maybe love even. Yes. To me, it has a lot of meaning about you know this something that is happening, something that is far away, but still very close to you, and. Yes, it's the the winter. The winter There's something moon. magical about winter, isn't yes. it? What is uh, the? Well, I don't know. I don't know how to translate it, but uh, but a kiss in winter uh, is interesting. Uh, lips in winter and all that kind of stuff is beautifully. I mean, Ru- Russian has a way. There's a reason Russian poetry is just. I'm a fan of poetry in both languages, but English um, doesn't capture some of the magic that Russian seems to. So, thank you for doing that. That was awesome. Dmitry, it's great to talk to you again. You're, um, it's contagious how much you love what you do, how much you love life. So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk today. And thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Dmitry Korkin. And thank you to our sponsors, Brave Browser, NetSuite, Business Management Software, Magic Spoon Low Carb Cereal, and A Sleep Self Cooling Mattress. So the choice is browsing privacy, business success, healthy diet, or comfortable sleep. Choose wisely, my friends. And if you wish, click the sponsor links below to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now, let me leave you with some words from Jeffrey Eugenides. Biology gives you a brain. Life turns it into a mind. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.